and welcome to The Family of Things, a podcast series of ideas, life and how we live it. I'm Helen Shaw and in this series I get to spend time with people living life with passion and ambition, with those seeking to make a difference in their time. And today my guest is a woman whose research helps illuminate past lives, a writer who captures truth in biography. Eleanor Fitzsimons is the author of Wilde's Women, a beautifully scripted book on the life of Oscar Wilde from the perspective of the women who helped shape him. Eleanor Wilde's Women is a truly epic piece of research. And it's introduced us to women like Wilde's mother, the wonderful, the eccentric Jane Wilde, and his ever patient, it seems, and suitably named wife, Constance Lloyd. But what drew you in the beginning to Wilde's story? I mean, what started this epic journey? Gosh, yes. Um, It's difficult to trace back, I suppose, when my interest in Oscar Wilde would have started. And I think in a sense it's because almost every Dubliner has this innate interest in Wilde. He's such a flamboyant and impressive citizen of of our city and our country that you're sort of drawn to him, I think, very early on. He was so colourful and so pioneering in his way and had such a tragic life. And the tragedy obviously lends great poignancy to his life and to his genius. So I was always interested in him. But I suppose also being Irish, there is this residual love for his mother. His mother is still a heroine in this country and in this city and she would be known to us more so than she would be perhaps known elsewhere in the world. So I was always aware of her. I knew that she was very flamboyant and also very accomplished and I assumed I suppose without necessarily knowing it at the time that she must have had an enormous influence on his life and on his work. That indeed proved to be the case. Then a few years back there was a little bit of a resurgence of interest I suppose in his wife Constance who had been overlooked and actually it's been remarked to me by Wildians that you almost can't say Constance without saying poor Constance because she's seen as this victim almost, this woman who was completely duped, I suppose, by her husband. But in fact, she was a very strong woman in her own way, very accomplished and very patient and very supportive of him. So it it stemmed from there, really, I suppose, the interest. And I think what's really incredible about the book is, one, the research is so thorough that you do open up lots of different viewpoints on Wilde and his work. It's such rich writing. But Jane Wilde, she is an incredible character. I mean, I did have a sense of her story before reading your book, but we really do seem to have missed her significance in modern day Ireland as a writer and as a literary force. I mean, she was hugely popular and famous in her time. Absolutely. She was a celebrity, in fact, well before Oscar was, and often he's deemed to be one of our first world celebrities, but she was a celebrity long before him, and her fame stretched beyond Ireland in her day. Not only was she a revolutionary poet here, and she would have had a a big following here in terms of the nationalist cause, but also she was a very, very accomplished and well-renowned translator of literary works. She spoke ten languages. She was completely self-taught. She had no access at all to formal education, but she was very studious by nature, in fact, and she taught herself to speak several European languages, and she then took on translation projects, books in French, books in Latin, books in German. She did an extremely good job on each of them, and she was acclaimed for her accomplishments there. She was also a journalist, particularly after she moved to London when her husband passed away and she was left destitute, effectively, having had a very privileged lifestyle. She was left destitute, she moved to London and she very quickly started to make her living as an essayist and a journalist and a commentator. And she also wrote several books that explored her ideas on things like what we would now describe as feminism, I suppose, you know, women's rights. Very pioneering in that regard. Always campaigned throughout her life for women to be allowed to access education and the professions. So she was extremely progressive and pioneering and very accomplished. And as you say, more famous at that time, particularly in the beginning, than Mm. Wilde himself. And particularly, in a sense, as a heroine from her writing for The Nation. Yes. And her work around nationalism in Ireland. She really was hugely important in the whole struggle for freedom, I suppose, for the, for the independence movement in Ireland. But she also was a very interesting figure because her involvement with the Young Irelander movement was very much across social strata, I suppose, and across the religious divide as well. She was very pioneering in that sense as well, you know. So we should recognise her as much as we would recognise any of these people, like Gavin Duffy or Mitchell or, or Thomas Davis. You know, she's right up there with them. 
From your perspective, Eleanor, how important is that about putting women's stories and women's voices back into history and back into our storytelling? I think it's hugely important. What's been said to me in response to my book has been that there have been aspects of Oscar Wilde as a man that we've missed. I mean, I think a lot of scholars would have considered his life to have been very thoroughly researched. But it's quite extraordinary to think that by leaving out a lot of the women, not just his mother or his wife, but also all of the women that he collaborated with and the women who commented on his life, Things were missed about his story and his work and his attitudes. His influences. It's extraordinary and his influences. I yeah. mean, you talk about this writer who, to my shame, I didn't know about because she's faded now, Ouida. Yes, extraordinary. seems to have been an extraordinary influence on his style and of that period. Yes, absolutely. A tour de force of her time. Best-selling novelist, pioneering in her use of language. Her books are very similar to his and she came well before him. Her books were written before his. But they were contemporaries to some extent and they knew each other. She was very admiring of him. He was very supportive of her, particularly when she fell on hard times. But he clearly admired her language and her use of language because he reviewed one of her novels. And in his very long review, a full page review, he remarked on how impressive her use of epigram was and he listed his favourite epigrams out of a recent novel and he also made reference to the fact that he had read a lot of her previous work so he admired her hugely but if you actually take some of her better known books and his Dorian Gray his only novel you find passages of description of these languid dandies who lounge about on chaise long and admire beautiful objets d'art that are very similar in style. Now, how long did it take you to research and put this book together? Because you do have a sense when I read it that I can really enter into the period. The sense of research about not just the characters, but his work and all of the biography around all the other characters that he meets, including, in a sense, Bram Stoker, George Bernard Shaw. We sometimes forget all the people who are parallel around, say, 1889, which is one of those seismic years to 1889 to 90, where so many things are happening in art and culture in Europe. Extraordinary time. Extraordinary. It is amazing to think that all of these people were contemporaries of each other and not just contemporaries, but knew each other, knew each other quite well. It was the era of the literary salon and they would have all very often been in the same room, chattering, enjoying cups of tea and cigarettes. And and Forget Twitter. They were actually (laughs) all just getting together every other week and his mother Jane was renowned for this these weekly salons Mm. where anybody who's anybody in art and culture or in a sense celebrity turns up turns up absolutely she was at the centre of it really in London her salons were famous and they attracted not only Londoners but people from Ireland obviously you know she, she very much attracted young Irish poets and writers like Yeats and like Bernard Shaw, who she took under her wing to a certain extent, but also Americans who would arrive into London for the season and they'd head straight for Jane's Salon, where they'd meet all of their contemporary English writers and and Irish writers. So yes, a, a total maelstrom of creativity, really. But yes, it's difficult. It's a balancing act, really, when you're dealing with that many people in a biography you want to give enough, you want to do them justice, but at the same time you don't have the luxury of pages and pages to explore their work and explore their lives. But in a sense, I suppose what people want very often is a decent snapshot, a good grasp, a good idea of what was happening at the time and what were their, their lives were like. So it's quite nice, actually, to have the luxury of just uh, writing a little bit, uh, a page or two about all of these amazing people. So I think you said it's about three years work. Yeah, obviously, now that it's published and, you know, that you'll be releasing it in the US across the next year, it'll go into paperback, etc. You're still living with Oscar Wilde. Very much so. Do you mm-hmm. still like him? I mean, by the end of the book, much as I love so much of what Wilde did mm. and wrote, there is that tension because of so many people who suffered by the end, particularly his children and the legacy they're left with by, in a sense, often his decisions as well. I mean, how do you how do you now live with Wilde and what's your perspective on him? Gosh, that's an interesting question. I I have a huge fondness for him still and it's almost the kind of fondness that you would have for a friend who behaved quite badly, who strayed in some sense, you know, who did something that you're really disapproving of but you still feel that at heart they're they're good and they're decent. And in a sense, I suppose that they never made any secret of who they were because he always said that he felt that in life nobody should be constrained and that they should do what they, what they felt that they should be allowed to do. But unfortunately, there are victims to that. You know, there are always victims. If you're going to live your life like that, there are going to be people who fall by the wayside and Constance, obviously, is the one that comes to mind first. But his sons, his sons had dreadful lives as well as a result. I mean, at the end, I suppose it's that last quarter of the book, your heart breaks for Vivian, 
his son particularly, you know, not just after his mother dies. They already think that Oscar Wilde is dead, the father. But then he later loses his brother as well. And yes. there's that awful moment which you have in the book that as a man in his 30s, for the first time he meets his first cousin at somebody's house gathering. And that's the only cousin he has really left. Yes which is Dolly Wilde. That's right. And they didn't even particularly get on, unfortunately. It's not like they had a great familial bond or anything. He was lucky in the sense, I suppose, that at a stage in his life when he would have been in his early 20s and really having known practically nothing at that stage about his father because his father had very much been written out of his life, he met up with a group of people who were great admirers of his father, almost by chance, really, through a school friend of his whose mother was very involved with Wilde's Circle. And through her, he was introduced to all of these people like Robbie Ross, for instance, who was there with Wilde on his deathbed. And was a really, really um, loyal was friend. A very loyal friend, very, very loyal and very decent person. He met up with that group of people and they gave him this great sense of who his father was and of how admirable he was. So at least he had that through that that group. But um, I suppose it, it's not that one has any sense of blame for Wilde in so many things, but it's that moment when he decides after he comes out of prison not to make that appointment that was made with Constance. Yes. And obviously then that was the opportunity to see the boys and he doesn't. He goes and meets Douglas. Yes. And that's the bit that broke my heart because they could have seen their father again. He could have maybe had a last positive meeting, uh, left something for them other mm. than the fact that the last time they see him is long before he goes to prison and they never have any sense after that of him. I mean, that that is that turning point when he doesn't meet Constance and breaks the appointment. Point. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I agree with you. It's a huge turning point. I think he thought he had time on his side. I'm sure he lived to regret that very deeply that he didn't make that meeting. But he just seems to have been in such thrall to this character, to this Lord Alfred Douglas, yeah. who just seemed to be able to literally snap his fingers. I suppose he was all about spontaneity and excitement, whereas Constance was all about safety Constance. and prudence <laughs> and Constance, absolutely. And, and you do say torn. in the book, which is, which is painful, which is he does say several times to his friends, marriage is boring. Yes. And ultimately that in many ways Constance was like that almost discussed like his mother. It was loyal. It was like a sister. Mm. But the affection was like that. There was no sense in which he described it after the children as anything other Mm -hmm. than that, something that was there, but ultimately was boring. The great passion was gone. Yes, absolutely. And third, third certainly would be evidence that there was passion there at the beginning. He was a very passionate man. I think he enjoyed romance and he enjoyed passion, but it had well gone by then in terms of his marriage. I think he would have been delighted to have a situation like his father's where he was accommodated, <laughs> let's say, accommodated by his wife. Because yeah. we should say that for listeners, that mean <laughs> Oscar Wilde's father basically married and already had a pre-existing family yes. with three other children who also died tragically young. Yeah, I know, the poor father family. They were so riddled with tragedy. But yes, he did. He came to the marriage with three children who he fully acknowledged and supported. And Jane knew and about. And Jane knew. Absolutely. She knew about them. And even when he's and dying, you have that scene that the woman in black turns up. What and an she extraordinary lets, scene. Mm. She lets, obviously, this long-standing mistress, almost like the second wife yes. or the first wife, be with them as, as his deathbed. Absolutely. And not a word exchanged between her or this veiled woman. And what's very telling about that episode is that Oscar hugely admired his mother for that and wrote about it at some length and said how he admired the way that she had seen how happy this would make his father, how his final moments would be enhanced by having this woman he loved by his bedside. And he thinks this is hugely admirable. And perhaps he's right. Perhaps in some senses he's right, you know. Just before we leave, Oscar, your sources and the references, mm-hmm. because I do have the strong sense in reading your book that, that there is fresh material, that, as you say, there is new ways of looking at wild story, which people often think they know well now mm. from it. How difficult it was it to find those sources and those moments and the accuracy around it. And you're very careful to often say to us, this person maybe is not a trusted witness. But talk to me about how challenging was it to research it and find those sources. And clearly you have a lot of support from Wilde's own grandson, his only grandson, Merlin. Yes, 
Yes, he's been hugely supportive, in fact, and very warm and very welcoming of this approach to Wilde's life and agreed that he felt an aspect had been missed by not looking at the women because Wilde was hugely involved with women throughout his life. Yes, it can be difficult. I think as a biographer, you can look for sources, but you can only be as accurate as the people that you're quoting, in a sense. So I think it is careful to qualify a lot of the stories that are told. The attitude that people had towards Oscar Wilde was coloured, certainly in the aftermath of his trials and imprisonment. And you often and get stories that just don't ring true sometimes, you know, or that feel exaggerated. And I think it's important to say in that case, this is a story that was told in good faith, perhaps, by this person, but we have to take it with a little bit of caution, you know, and, and look at it in the overall sense of his life and his story. And does it ring true? Perhaps it happened. Perhaps it's been exaggerated. So it's just important to caution the reader, I think, a little bit when, when situations like that arise. Having said that, his life was very much in the public eye, very well covered, very well written about. So there are lots of sources. Newspapers obviously are a very good source of information and they tended to report gatherings and the openings of plays and things like that in great detail, in detail that perhaps we don't get anymore in our newspapers. So they're a great source of information. Everybody wrote letters all of the time, several a day in great detail. So they're also a great source. And then people kept diaries and wrote biographies and autobiographies. So there was no shortage really of sources of information. Eleanor, If you can, maybe just share with us a little moment from the book and share a little bit of your writing from Wild's Women. Okay, um, I'm going to read a short piece from a chapter called Stories for Girls because a lot of the stories that Wilde wrote and and stories that are very dear to us nowadays were in fact written for and inspired by a lot of the women he knew. When Amy Lowther was a child, she would rush home to write down the wonderful stories that her friend Oscar told her. Years later, in 1912, four of these stories were published in The Mask, a quarterly journal of the art of the theatre. They were The Poet, The Actress, Simon of Cyrene and Jezebel. Each one was captioned, an unpublished story by Oscar Wilde, and prefaced with the words, This story was told by Wilde to Miss Amy Lowther when a child and written out by her. A few copies were privately printed, but this is the first time it has been given to the public. Amy was in her 40s by then and had enjoyed some success as a playwright and amateur actress. The veracity of her claim was borne out by a letter she received from Oscar in August 1899, asking her not to allow the publication of what he described as the little poem in prose I call The Poet, as it was due to appear next week in a Paris magazine above my own signature. No such magazine has ever been identified. Another of these stories, The Actress, is thought to have been inspired by Ellen Terry. Edward Gordon Craig, editor of The Mask, was her son and Amy her close confidant. Oscar loved Amy. If you had been a boy, you'd have wrecked my life, he declared. In return, she remained loyal to the end and a visit from her could lift his spirits even when he was at his low step. Your friendship is a blossom on the crown of thorns that my life has become, he assured her. A troilet he wrote describing her eyes was set to music by her remarkable sister Topi. Your eyes are deep green pools in which the sun has gazed and passing left a golden ray. Although Lather's story is entirely plausible, confusion arose when Gabriel Entoven, a passionate collector of theatrical memorabilia, claimed that Oscar had told these stories to her. In 1948, she presented the British Library with a copy of Echoes, a limited edition 12-page pamphlet she had commissioned which contained the four stories in question. Amy Lowther owned a copy of Echoes, which she later gave to Oscar's younger son, Vivian, and the stories reproduced in Echoes and The Mask are almost word for word the same. Beautiful. And in a sense, it's that richness of the language married with the research, which makes it such an enjoyable but illuminating read. And Eleanor, as a writer, where did your journey start in writing works like this? I mean, where did it begin? I've been writing for years and I suppose after I came back to Ireland. I lived in London for a while and I had two small children. I started to write features and opinion pieces and small book reviews and things like that for newspapers and for magazines. But as my children got older, my time became my own, I suppose, and I had more time to concentrate on bigger projects. And it came to a point there where I really felt I wanted to get stuck into something with a bit more meat to it, something a bit more challenging than just articles and reviews and features. So what I did was I went back to university, I went back to UCD, hadn't been there for 25 years, 
and I took a course that's called Women, Gender and Society because I was very determined really to write about women and to write women back into history. I'd always had this sense that women had been left out, not only left out in terms of their stories, but also in terms of their accounts, their eyewitness accounts and their views on the people that we might feel familiar with, like Wild. Uh, so I went back to UCD for a year, did a master's degree. And then from there, I sent off a pitch to an agent in London, Andrew Lowney, wonderful agent, in fact, who took me on, but took me on on the basis of a different book, not the Wild book. And from there, really, it was just a series of, you know, going out to publishers, entering for prizes. I was lucky enough to win one prize and come runner up in another. And over about a year or so, when we discussed various things I could work on, the idea of the Wild book came up, started on that and came to where I am today. It was picked up by a publisher. And it's been really well reviewed. I mean, Mm. from the perspective of somebody who probably doesn't have an enormous amount of track Mm. in this type of work, you've entered into it at a very high level. I mean, the perspective on that, obviously, as you say, your agent has given you perhaps that guidance within it. But that first book that you talked about, or maybe the influence that happened there, that was Shelley? That's right. It was Percy Shelley, but in fact, it was in particular Harriet Shelley, his first wife. I find her story fascinating, very tragic. She lived only 21 years. She took her own life when she was heavily pregnant with a third child, but probably not her husband's child. They were estranged at that stage for two years. So her life is very tragic. But what I saw it as was a conduit, really, a way into a social history of women at the time, because her life was very restricted by expectations. She was well educated and she was an intelligent girl but because of the expectations that were placed upon her she got married far too young she had children far too early and when her husband abandoned her she was left with very few options in life and then she became pregnant a third time which was an absolute tragedy very difficult situation for a girl to find herself in and her life ended. Unfortunately, it was difficult to find a publisher for that book because she's deemed to be not significant enough a character. I think if I had maybe taken the approach that I took with Wilde of writing about Shelley and talking about the women in his life, because in fact, he also had an extraordinary attitude towards women. Absolutely. In some ways, very enlightened, but unfortunately a bit naive because he didn't realise, I think, that the, the things that he felt women should be able to do, the things that he did, would leave them in dire straits. He suggested to Harriet, his his first wife when she was 16, that they just run off together and set up home. It wasn't really to get married, as he saw it, that they could just live together. And she looked at him aghast and said, how could I do that? I'd be completely outcast. You know, society would judge me so harshly. That couldn't happen. But no. I have read, I think it's Muriel Sparks' biography on Mary Shelley. Yes. And in some ways that connects with a little bit with Harriet as well. But you do get that sense that, yes, there is this view, which is very bohemian, that we should be free, open mm. and live our lives. But the difficulty for women is they don't have those choices. You exactly. Know, they become pregnant mm-hmm. and incidences like the one that killed poor old William Wiles' two daughters yes. in terms of crinoline dresses getting caught on fire. They're the number one reasons that women died in young years, childbirth and Mm. and bizarre accidents like that. So in a sense, that idea that that Shelley had and maybe even that Oscar Wilde had, that that it all should be free and open, Mm. it's limited by the realities of women's lives, their reproductive lives. And not so much by the men's lives. You know, Shelley made sacrifices too. He was cut off by his family. He came from quite a wealthy family and they cut him off completely without a penny. But he was prepared to take that risk. He felt very strongly about what he was doing. But he could earn a living. He could write. You know, he had resources. Harriet had nothing. She could fall back on nothing. She wasn't going to be given the opportunities that he had. And as you say, she gave birth to children when she was very young. She was 19 when she had their second child. So you're just left with such limited resources and options in life. You don't have the luxury of being able to do what the Shelleys and the Wilds of this world do. And I think perhaps they were naive in their lack of understanding of the limits that women faced. It's interesting to bring that into what I'm curious about is your motivation Mm. in tackling those subjects. In some ways, these stories of men through the prism of women and the light that that shines on women's lives. Mm -hmm. That that has to come from your own perspective in looking at the world. That you see, (laughs) you know, in one way that that our way of telling stories is that it's not a biography of Jane Wilde. Mm. It's a biography still because it has to be in many ways of Oscar's life, which is the vehicle. Mm -hmm. What's your sense of that, that in many ways we still are being defined often by what men do? I think any biography that you pick up 
with the exception maybe of a few that have been written by women, are all told from the perspective of men and all told in the public sphere. So even the the famous and very thorough biographies of Wilde's life will always talk about his writing contemporaries and what they felt about his work and how they judged him. So you'll have things like George Bernard Shaw's very telling and very insightful review of the importance of being earnest is quoted very often. But you get very little sense of the women who were in the theatre that night. So I have Ada Leverson and some of the actresses that played the key parts in the play describing how they felt the, the night went and what they felt was happening and, and the reaction of the audience. Absolutely. It's a much richer, mm. more layered, multidimensional more rounded, view yes, that you start rounded. to see his influences, not just in, in his relationships, but in writers being women and also how he influenced the w- other women like mm. Frances Hodgnett Burnett and the yes. uh, little Lord Fauntleroy where you, you make that point and connection that actually that dress that she depicts and, and puts her character in mm. is influenced by meeting Wilde. Absolutely. With that flamboyant and um, outre there costume seems to be, in America. Yes, clear evidence. There seems to be to suggest that when he turned up at her meeting of the Washington Literary Society in her house, he was very flamboyantly dressed. He was on a publicity campaign for his lecture tour. A lot of what he did was pose. It was PR. It was publicity. He didn't dress like that very often when he was at home in front of the fire. But he turned up very flamboyantly dressed. She was very impressed by him. You, you couldn't but be impressed by him. And a couple of years later, she was writing about little Lord Fauntleroy and his curls and his velvet suits. And she was dressing her own sons in that way too and growing their hair long. So I'm certainly not the first to make that parallel. It's been pointed out before by biographers of hers. Now Wilde was interesting in the sense that he did have this great belief that you should do whatever you wanted to do in life and therefore he was hugely encouraging of a lot of women. There are several women's careers who really owe their impetus to his influence and to him stepping in at a crucial point and saying go for it, do it, paint that picture, write that play, I'll help you, I'll fund you even at times. Which which in many ways must have come from Jane, from his mother and seeing his mother do that and that was the role model that he'd grown up with was this very determined public and also a woman who had work. Mm. She always worked. She was never without work. Even when she was comfortably married to a very successful man and living in, in her own words, the most desirable house, which is the lovely house on Marion Square, number one Marion Square, she still always worked. She always translated. And when she wasn't working in those short periods of time, when she was just after having one of her children or whatever it might be, she lamented the fact that she wasn't working. And she said how boring it was and how she wanted to get back and stuck into some big novel to translate or do something productive with her time. So she was a huge influence she must have been how could she not be a great role model for any young man or young woman who had a mother like that but yes I think he certainly started off life with the belief that women could achieve whatever they wanted to were just as intelligent just as capable and just as creative as men and in a sense coming from that back to where we are now you know we think so much has changed and many things have changed but this conversation about putting women back into the story particularly in history and in our sense Mm. of our identity our national identity our cultural identity and seeing things with that connection between both the public and the private Mm -hmm. which is often where the male and the female lives connect in history but is that part of your motivation when you think about your work and your writing? Very much so. It's recovering history, recovering stories that are there, things that happen. Recovering's a great word. Mm, I think so, absolutely. I had an interesting discussion actually with somebody at a conference in the University of York. We were talking about difficult women, great theme for a conference because the difficult could be interpreted in a sense in any way you wanted to. Sometimes women were difficult because they tried to be too much out there, too much out in the public eye and, and quite pushy. But this woman was talking about how in terms of women writers, we're still at the stage of just getting their work into the public eye and we next need to start an evaluation process because sometimes you're just recovering and recovering and recovering all these novels and poems and music that was composed by women and then you have to turn around and and start evaluating it in the way that men's work is evaluated but we're still very much in that recovery process because the work has been neglected and overlooked and sidelined and we're like that with the the histories and the lives as well. It's an interesting way to think about it that it's like archaeology Mm, that we have to actually scrape back all the layers that's been put over our identity, our stories, to actually see what's really there before we can assess it. This is a very interesting process and actually it seems in 2016 this is still what we're going to be doing. We're still going to be doing that for quite some time to come, I think. And it's great for me because there's a richness of of material there. I really do believe for any women historians or for any historians at all, be they male or female, there is a rich seam of material to be tapped into, I think, by looking at women's stories. 
So it's great in some ways. It's very exciting. So talk to us about what you might see as that that rich seam. Where would you and where are you moving now in the ideas and the stories that you might want to recover? I think it's quite difficult sometimes to get at women's stories unless they were in some way in the public eye. And very often that was through their connection with a man with a very famous man, be they married to him or or collaborating or something like that. So I think I'd like to continue that type of work of maybe taking a man like Percy Shelley, for instance, and looking at their lives through the prism of women. So you are still in the process, I suppose, of finding that next book. Yes, I'm drawn back towards the romantics and I still write you about like that them period. Quite, quite a lot. I do know the world is such a difficult place at times that it's nice to go back in time. And it wasn't that it wasn't difficult back then as well, because a lot of the work that I've done on the romantics was dominated by the Napoleonic War is a dreadful time. But at least it was long ago and far away. So it's quite nice to go back in history and live your life. I, I actually like immersing myself in a different time period. And your own roots, both in your love of history, mm-hmm. and storytelling and writing, Where did they come from? I mean, what kind of family and background did you Mm. grow up in? Were they writers? Did you have books around you? Were you always fascinated by the past? Yes, always. I had an aunt. She was my dad's aunt, actually. So, But they were very close. And my dad had quite a a tragic family background and both his parents died quite early and he was raised by by relations. And she was one of them, a very key figure in his life. But she was an archaeologist and a writer. What she did was that she wrote about the folklore of Ireland and she wrote collections of, of stories uh, she was very heavily involved, in fact, in the campaign for Wood Key and the saving of Wood Key. She was a very elderly lady at that stage. And I think it probably contributed to her death, the poor thing. But she wrote poems to the Irish Times and letters to the what Irish was Times. Her name? Um, Hannah, Hannah Fitzsimons. She was a retired school teacher, never married, um, had, I suppose, substitute children in my father and his sister. But she was such an admirable woman, such an amazing pioneering woman for her day and so scholarly and so I would have been hugely influenced by her. That's fantastic. Being an aunt I love the idea that Mm. it's an aunt who did that because sometimes aunts or uncles can be that independent voice that can open us to other places and other areas in our lives. So she probably influenced your whole journey then. Hugely. I remember so clearly going around to her house and she just always had teetering piles of papers and books on every surface so you'd be moving things to sit down because she was always researching something she was well retired at that stage but she was always researching she loved knowledge loved knowledge was a member of the Royal Dublin Society we were very impressed because one year she was invited down to Newgrange for the solstice so she was very much in that inner circle she was well recognised as albeit an amateur um, archaeologist because it wasn't a profession to her she was doing it as something that she did after her retirement as a school teacher but a hugely admired amateur archaeologist and a font of knowledge and a very, very learned woman. She had a huge influence. Yes, she did, in fact. Um, We stayed with her for a while. I remember we moved house. We came up from Cork when I was only about three or four and we stayed in her house and it was just such an amazing place to stay because it was a house without children but it was a house full of of learning and books and little hiding places in libraries and things like that and it was great. So she was an extraordinary woman. And Eleanor, where you are now, this long, very authored walk into history and biography, mm. this has now shaped where you're going to go over the yes. next period. I mean, it's always very difficult to do that, to sustain that in the years that you would create these kind of vast tomes of research. You know, you're now in an environment where there's been wonderful reviews for this book across very esteemed publication. So you're on the other side. Yes. But has it been a challenging journey? I'm dying to dive back in and do the research, to be honest. I think it's lovely to have the mixture. I really do. I like being out there. In some ways, I'm kind of a classic introvert, I suppose, in that I, I love my own company. I love being at home. I love working to my own speed and my own devices. But I also love being out in the public eye, too, and doing things like this. It's great fun. And so it's great to have a mixture. But you can do enough of one thing and then want to dive back into the other thing. So I found certainly when I was putting the book together, I used to alternate between researching and writing. And you just research so deeply and I tend to get very dogged with pieces of information. I dig down and dig down and try and find more out and more out about somebody or about some incident to the point that I remember contacting a a library in America to find out about just one line in one letter. And I said, look, can you just confirm that there was a letter written by this actress to a theatre reviewer describing why she had turned down Oscar Wilde's second play. And they 
in fairness to them, went off for a couple of days and dug around to their archives and came back and said, how did you know about that? They said, because that packet of letters was never opened. It's still dusty and tied up with string. We've never got to that part of the archive yet. How did you know it existed? I felt really proud about that, in fact. So you really sometimes have to dig and dig and... Dogged is the word. Dogged is the word, absolutely. Never give up. Now... I know you're very busy on social media and you're a lover of Twitter and I think that's how I met you first. Probably is. So fact, many, yes. many years ago <laughs> on, on Twitter exchanges mm. and you've been involved in a lot of very positive initiatives around that, particularly mm. on women in media and women's role in, in Irish society. But in that scenario of how we find out things now in a digital age, do you mm-hmm. think it's changed? I mean, your book is that solid like that. The letters, the diaries, the phone calls, the checking sources, all of the things that we love mm. from true historical work and good journalism. Do you think things have changed to an, an extent where it's become easier to do that in a digital age or it's become challenged by the fact that so much information <laughs> can go out there and in fact what often am- amuses me about Oscar Wilde is that he gets credited with stuff that in no way did he ever say and you say no he didn't, didn't. Ever <laughs> <laughs> all the time all the time you see quotes attributed to him that he either never said which is very often the case or else that characters in his plays said and are completely attributed to him exactly and he as if he just wandered around saying character. this but yeah. so as a digital mm. media lover in, and in social uh-huh. media user, the pros and cons, because I suppose yes. there is that balance for all of us. And, and it, it's what I love about your book is that it brings us back to that. Get your, your sources, check, your check sources. them. Absolutely. Check keep your sources. keep mm. checking, assume yeah. nothing. And much as maybe digital has liberated information. Yeah. And it's it also hugely. opened mm. the proverbial Pandora's box. It has, and therefore you have to be very careful. You can be overwhelmed with information, just a complete overload. But in fact, I would say on balance, it's been very much more of a positive than a negative thing because I probably would have taken seven years to write that book 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier. You would have had to travel to every archive. You would have had to particularly go to America and sat in basements of dusty libraries, whereas now so much has been digitised and put online. And it's really very generous of institutions to do that. I'm in huge awe and admiration. It's so expensive and it's so time consuming to do that, particularly the American universities, to their credit, believe that this is information that should be out there, that should be available to scholars, but also be available to just interested parties, anybody who wants to pick up and read things. For instance, Jane Wilde's books, fascinating books of essays, long out of print. You'll never walk into any bookshop and find them. They're all online. They're all in archive.org. Every single one of them is there to be read. I do get the sense from reading it and also just even connecting with the story that so many people are pleased that you've raised the profile again yes. of Jane Wilde, that her story goes right centre into it. Obviously, Constance's and Florence Balcom, who was perhaps his first love or one of them. He was yes. engaged to her and she goes on to marry Bram Stoker. That's right. Which is all incredible, all these characters wandering around. But I loved the line in the book where you say that her descendants, Noel, they're so mm. happy that, that they're, is it their grand that mother? That was lovely. Their great grandmother? Their great grandmother. Um, when you're starting out and when you're contacting people like Marilyn Holland or, or like the, the Stoker family, you're so frightened that they'll just go, what are you doing? You know nothing about my family. You know, don't go near them. Quite the opposite. In fact, the Stoker family, two members, wrote to me and said, how refreshing to have somebody inquiring about Florence. Everybody always writes to us about Bram. We, you know, we get letters every day about Bram. But to come to us and look for information on Florence, our wonderful great-grandmother, is just brilliant and so refreshing. And they were great. They gave me access to all of the papers in Trinity. Couldn't have been more helpful, more supportive. And you really have a sense that nobody could start to understand Bram Stoker without now understanding Florence and the role she Mm. has played in his work and also his work's life after his death. Yes. She was phenomenal ensuring that the, the Stoker legacy continued and he remained mm. in control of that. She protected his legacy and kept it alive, very much so. You know, I don't know what would have happened to Dracula had she not been so tenacious in her protection of, of the rights to it. And that aside, which is so interesting, which is where Dracula comes from. You always see it attributed to half a dozen things. And Mm. yet you have this moment. Sarah Bernhardt, the French actress who was a 
close friend of Oscar's, but they also collaborated on Salome very closely. And her husband, who was a complete waster, this Greek man who was a wannabe actor who she completely supported and, and he treated her abominably. But he was at a dinner one night at the Beefsteak Club, which was behind the scenes at the Lyceum Theatre. And, and Bram was the manager of the Lyceum Theatre. And he happened to have the misfortune to sit beside this character. And he wrote afterwards about looking at this man and being so intrigued by him because it was like he was the living dead. He looked like a corpse because he was so drug addled and his skin was so bad and perspiring and everything. But he just was fascinated and drawn to this character. And you have to believe that fed in some way into to Dracula. Into his depiction of him. And yeah. his name wasn't far off. Yes. Damala, I think his name was Damala. He was a Greek man. The other very telling episode in Dracula, of course, is for quite a long time, scholars wondered why had Bram Stoker written about Transylvania? You know, where did that come from? Why Romania? He didn't have no, no evidence he'd ever been there or anything. But if you look at Jane's book published 10 years before Dracula, when she collects myths and legends, she says that the Irish mythology and the Irish system of beliefs is very similar to that of Transylvania. And she goes on to cite examples. One of her examples is the idea of the living dead, that the dead arise and walk. So... So it all connects. A, a Jane could be the source. Certainly for one of them. Certainly Bram's one of Dracula. them. They're influences. Mm. They're all. Yes. I think that's what is so mm. enlightening or illuminating about your work when you look at that. They are contemporaries. So yes. just try and see them in isolation is to really miss the point because mm. they're all bouncing off each other. They're reading each other. They're sharing ideas. So there is a sense that to understand the root of Bernard Shaw. You mm. have to also recognise he's sharing that society with Wilde. That in some ways, while they're very different playwrights, that there are parallels. There are indeed parallels, yes. And they were very open with each other about their work. They critiqued each other's work. They talked about their influences. There are letters from Wilde to uh, Bernard Shaw clapping each other in the back almost about being the foremost two playwrights, the Irish playwrights, you know. So yes, they were very much contemporaries and, and they were very often together discussing their work. So they must have had influence on each other. And, and I love that idea that they were almost like this Hibernia yes. support club and mm. they saw themselves as being that the the outsiders. And while mm. they came from a particular type of Irish society, but they had that sense of not being English and not being Londoners. Yes. And that when they supported each other or shared ideas that they were coming from that same place. Very much so. Very much that separate identity, absolutely. Which in many ways fed into Wilde's downfall, unfortunately, because it's very easy to drop somebody who's an outsider. Um, they're fine while they're entertaining you, but once they cease to entertain you, it's very easy to cut them off. And unfortunately, that's in many ways what happened to him. Eleanor Fitzsimons, researcher, writer, historian, thank you very much for sharing your story today. Thank you, Helen.